Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Welcome to our webinar on Human Genome Editing, Science, Ethics, and Governance. I'm Sharon Terry. I'm the President and CEO of Genetic Alliance. Genetic Alliance is a large network dedicated to keeping the patient, consumer, research participant, uh, ethos, uh, experts, expectations, interests, and outcomes, et cetera, at the center of every conversation. And so we're very excited to host this webinar. I was a participant in a committee um, that we'll discuss in a, a moderate amount of detail here that the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine put together uh, on human genome <clears throat> editing. And we thought that this would be a really wonderful webinar to offer to all of you so that you could hear the results of the committee's deliberation uh, over more than a year. We have about 350 of you on the webinar. Uh, we're asking everyone to mute unless you uh, are speaking, and that will go for our speakers as well. Participants, you are muted naturally, and we also will not be allowing uh, verbal questions because of the large number of individuals on the phone. And so we're asking you to type your questions into the question box uh, on the side there. You'll see a little pop-up on the, on the side of your screen, the go to webinar control panel. Uh, and in there, you can type a question. I will be taking the question, I expect we'll get uh, uh, nearly 100 or so, and bu bucketing them so that our speakers can uh, answer those questions uh, toward the end of the webinar. And so, um, without further ado, I'm going to turn uh, this over to uh, Katie Bowman to give you an uh, a, a introduction to the, the uh, webinar's uh, content, which is the, the workshop, uh, the um, committee that we were part of. She was the study director. Uh, for that study. Katie? Um, great. Thank you so much, Sharon, and thank you so much to, to Genetic Alliance and to everybody on the, the call for, for joining us uh, for this webinar to discuss the National Academy's report on human genome editing. Um, I, just a note for those who are on the webinar who might be interested, um, at the link that should be shown on your screen right now, nationalacademies.org slash gene editing slash consensus study, we have not only the, the full report available for a free PDF download, but we also have a number of um, brief uh, focused resources that can uh, be available there, including one that we um, just uh, are debuting, uh, which is a guide for patients and families affected by inherited diseases and disabilities. So that might be of interest. Um, I just want to, to briefly start uh, by talking a little bit about what genome editing is. Um, and essentially, this is a set of, of tools that are available to, to scientists and clinicians to um, make targeted changes to DNA that can be adding uh, pieces of DNA, deleting pieces of DNA, um, inactivating genes, or kind of making other uh, alterations. And, and what happens then is that there is a sort of um, element to these tools that recognizes specific places in the DNA, kind of homes in on those places, and is able to to cut that DNA and then other mechanisms are used to, to introduce the specific um, change that's desired into that piece of DNA. Um, I think I, I want to mention, and, and you all on the phone are probably familiar with the fact that this is not an entirely new concept. There have been other generations of, of tools that researchers have developed to make changes to DNA, um, and there has been a, a history of uh, trying to develop therapeutic approaches, um, kind of gene therapy strategies for, for dealing with genetic diseases. Um, however, there has been a lot of interest uh, in the last couple of years based on this newer set of tools, CRISPR-Cas9. And this system is, is generating an enormous amount of excitement. Um, partly that's because it's, it's technically um, a, a change in approach in which it's no longer guided to the specific piece of DNA by a protein, but it's now guided by RNA, which is um, it, it basically enables the tool to be much more efficient, less costly, and more, more versatile, and it's kind of exploding across the, the research community. So as a result, then, of this um, groundswell of, of interest uh, in making uh, precise changes in, in uh, genomes, the National Academy of Sciences and the National Academy of Medicine uh, were asked to take a look at what these types of tools we're enabling, uh, particularly regarding human genome editing, and then what the implications of, of that, those uses could be. So the charge, which I've just put up on your screen, has several different aspects. 
um, in the, the first hand, the committee was looking really at the scientific promise of this technology, kind of what is the state of the science, what are the potential clinical applications now and in the future, as, as well as um, how well this works in humans and what the potential um, risks may be of, of using this technology in humans. And then in addition to that, and, and, and a very important component, is whether the um, ethical and legal standards that are in place um, are adequately addressing the different uses of human genome editing, sort of what, what those ethical implications are, which you're definitely going to be hearing more about from our committee members on the webinar, and the, the principles or frameworks that could help guide appropriate governance of the use of this technology. Uh, Science Now is in a global context, and, um, and so as one is wrestling with these frameworks for governance and with these uh, ethical and legal dimensions for the use of genome editing technology in humans, um, I think th there's also a, a need to discuss to what extent one can um, harmonize policies across countries or at least to discuss um, common ground and, and collaboration as these uh, tools continue to be developed. I'm just going to briefly introduce the three main um, applications of genome editing that the committee looked at. The first use is, um, is really in, in just pure uh, basic research conducted in the laboratory on cells and tissues, which uh, can have a lot of um, ad advantage in gaining a basic understanding of how uh, things work and uh, advancing fundamental knowledge in a number of areas. And then there are also two different types of potential clinical applications um, in patients. So the one that is a uh, focus of a lot of current attention would be editing in the majority of your kind of normal cells in the body. That's called uh, somatic um, clinical human gene editing uh, in order to treat or prevent uh, disease or um, disability. Uh, and, and then there are other types of cells that one could imagine editing. And so uh, there are, of course, human gamete cells, eggs and sperm, or the precursor cells that form those eggs and sperm, or early stage human embryos. And one could theoretically imagine um, conducting genome editing in those types of cells um, that would also have the intention of, of treating or preventing disease. Um, the, the uh, challenge or the, the, the important uh, component of that is, that is that edits that are made in that fashion in those specialized um, cells w could potentially be heritable to future generations, and that raises a whole different set of, of um, ethical and legal concerns that you'll hear more about uh, um, over the course of the webinar. Uh, I just want to note uh, sort of the way that the National Academies approaches these, the topics that we look at and this particular study, which is to go through a committee process um, in which we, we appoint an international committee, I'll, I'll show their names in the next slide, um, to examine the relevant literature, to, to gather input through a number of public meetings um, held in D.C. Held, uh, we held one um, in, in Paris in concert with a number of uh, European academies. Um, we heard from clinicians, from researchers, from ethicists, from policymakers, from members of the public, uh, from patient advocacy groups, um, in order to really try to understand a range of uh, perspectives on this technology. And then uh, finally, the last slide I want to show before turning it over to our committee members is, is a list of our 22-person our committee that really did um, span these different dimensions that were necessary to, to discuss the task, including um, research, clinical medicine, um, ethics, uh, legal and regulatory perspectives, uh, public engagement. Um, and, and as you can see from this, this list, we had folks from not only the U.S., but also from um, Israel, from, from France, from Egypt, from a number of international countries, from China, to really, again, reflect the fact that this is a, a global um, advance and a, a need to kind of look globally at what the implications of this technology could be for, for use in humans. So for the rest of the webinar, then, you're going to hear from two members of our, our uh, committee, Jeff Kahn, who is the director of the Berman Institute of Bioethics at Hopkins, and then Alta Chara, who was our co-chair and is a professor of law and bioethics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So, um, so Jeff, I'm going to turn it over to you to discuss uh, some of the governance principles and the ethical issues associated um, with, with human genome editing. Great. Thanks, Katie. And let me just add my, um, my thanks for um, the invitation and my, my welcome to you all. Um, 
so I, I'm going to um, now take us through a, a little bit of the um, work of the committee and its conclusions, as Katie just said. My, my first slide is um, a depiction of uh, our answer, the committee's answer to one of the um, parts of our charge, which was what ought to be the overarching principles to, to govern and guide the uses of human genome editing tools on an international um, level. And so as you see here, there were, uh, the committee identified seven such principles. We ex explain um, each of them in um, some detail in the report. I, I won't do that here except to sort of um, maybe explain a little bit what some of the more cryptic words mean. So promoting well-being as an important principle uh, to, to guide how we think about the appropriate uses, so to, to provide benefit. Um, transparency is what it sounds like, so making sure that the science in these areas proceeds in a way that uh, the rest of the scientific community and uh, other stakeholders are able to um, access what's being done and, and how and why. Do care is taken, that is sort of a, a general way of saying these are um, uh, important and somewhat uh, uncertain areas of, of science. We're not exactly sure of all the implications and uh, um, the, the, the ways that the applications may work as the science proceeds, and so we ought to do that um, thoughtfully and, and carefully. Uh, science should be responsible. Uh, among the ethical principles that we thought were really important was that, that respect for persons needed to be um, highlighted and important um, um, among the, the principles for governance, that is individuals get to make decisions for themselves in some, con some um, cultural context, that's a more important principle than others, and I'll say something about how this might work internationally in a second. Uh, fairness, so among the things that are uh, obviously of, of concern when you think about the ethics of um, both, both proceeding in the science and then eventual application of these technologies that they be uh, applied fairly, that is the risks and the benefits of early science um, be um, spread in a fair way, but also that the benefits once uh, these techniques are shown to be beneficial ought to be shared equitably as well. And then the last of those principles uh, cooperation in a transnational way so that we learn from each other, we um, try to govern in ways that will um, not create situations where there's an incentive to go to places where there are uh, fewer or less onerous um, regulations necessarily um, so that we might proceed in a, in a way that the international community might um, do in a, in a collaborative and careful way. So the bright side of this slide says, as you note, that these are, are governance principles that ought to be incorporated, but that any nation considering the governance of these new areas um, ought to incorporate principles in, in a way that makes the most sense for them into their regulatory structures and, and processes. So in some cultural contexts, uh, the, the idea of respect for persons, which is, has a very high level of attention in the United States and other um, liberal democracies might not have such an, a, a high place of, of um, um, attention in countries where the collective may be um, deemed to be more important. So the point there being these are, are not meant to be hierarchical and not meant to be applied in one way that, that societies and cultures will need to apply them in the way that makes sense for them and within their structures. Um, just to sort of shift here and get a little practical, so just the example of how genome editing tools might be used um, in, in something like Huntington's disease, and I don't need to belabor with this group that it's a, a disease that's, that's quite um, uh, devastating to the individuals who are affected and their families. As you see, it's tens of thousands of Americans who actually have um, HD and um, hundreds of thousands more who are at risk. So there, there's a now work going on in the basic science realm. Uh, of, of trying to figure out how, um, if it's possible and how, if so, to delete what is the genetic mutation that causes Huntington's disease. So that's all in vitro in the laboratory, not in, not in humans. Um, the, the next step would be to take what is learned from that basic research and apply it in living individuals who um, either are or are likely to be affected. So as Katie said before, somatic cells are the cells that make up the body that are, that are not sperm and eggs, that are not the cells that allow us to reproduce. 
And so when modifications are made to somatic cells, that they, they, those changes die with the individual who has been modified. They're not passed on. And so there's work proposed that, that might um, target somatic cells such that genome editing could be used to effectively either reduce or, or eradicate the, the problems in, in a living person who is at risk of Huntington's disease from uh, having that, those effects um, occur for them. And then the, the, the next step, if it were deemed to be ethically permissible, and we'll talk about that in a second, is to take that, that application one step further and modify the reproductive cells such that a person who's at risk of passing on the mutation that causes Huntington's disease to the next generation would not do that. So modify sperm and eggs, the germ cells, as it says here, to ensure that parents who are at risk uh, of passing on Huntington's disease don't do so to their children and therefore to their children's children. So it would effectively remove that risk from not only the children of the person who's at risk, but from all future generations in that line of individuals. The, uh, Katie did a little bit of this, but let me spend a little more time talking about the kinds of uses that might, uh, that genome editing tools might be, um, to which they might be put in the human context. So you heard about uh, basic science uh, research involving somatic cells. So as it says here, blood cells, liver cells, heart cells, any other cell in the body besides sperm and egg. Um, also basic science in, in germ cells. So how, how to, um, in the laboratory, learn about reproduction uh, of genetically modified um, sperm or eggs or even early stage embryos for a, a better understanding of what we, we might do in terms of applying those tools into um, the germline potentially later. And then um, pluripotent stem cells, so cells that are either embryonic in, in their um, origin or induced pluripotent stem cells, modifying them using genome editing techniques in ways that could make them um, more useful than would otherwise be the case. And so as it says here, these kinds of basic research approaches would be potentially useful to advance understanding of the way genes function and are regulated, repair mechanisms with, within DNA, um, cell biology, um, immunology, as I said, human fertility reproduction and development of early stage uh, human fetuses, the, the links between um, genes and uh, potential disease and, and how the, a disease progresses uh, and the symptoms that may occur as a result of particular genetic information. So lots of potential application in basic research. As, as you'll hear also um, Charles say in, a, in a, a couple of minutes, there are strong regulations in, in place for, for this and she'll talk more about that. So not a lot of ethical issues in this area except when we start to talk about um, modification and research involving human embryos, which has had a long um, standing policy in the U.S. in terms of, of restriction and prohibition in, in federal funding terms in modification or, or any research that um, um, harms or destroys a human embryo. So this, this would not be different than um, what is currently sort of in place. The next step would be somatic therapy. So that is trying to, to use genome editing tools to create therapeutic uh, outcomes in living people. So it would effectively be using a new tool for what has been called gene therapy, which was a, a much less precise, which was using much less precise tools to do genetic modification of individuals in ways that would blunt or, or reduce or prevent a genetic disease from occurring. So to do that, you could think of it in two ways. One is to remove cells that, that had a genetic mutation, edit them in the laboratory, and then put them back into the person's body. So for, by example, as it says here, removing blood cells for treatment of cancer, which is called immunotherapy. So that's for someone who had a kind of leukemia, say, a cancer of the blood system, or um, somebody who w was at risk of, or had HIV, doing some genome editing on uh, the cells that were removed, putting them back in a way that enhanced their immunity or gave them immunity they didn't have before, such that they would be resistant or could more easily clear an infection, say. Uh, another example would be um, something like sickle cell disease or one of the thalassemias. So taking cells out, modifying them in the laboratory, putting them back, that would be an ex vivo approach to doing somatic cell therapy. The other would be inserting something into the body that would go to the right place. So 
for instance, it's, it's an easier thing to get um, modified cells to go to the liver, uh, as it says here. So that would be a kind of early target or something like the muscle and get genetically modified cells into either of those two targets such that um, a, a problem could be um, either prevented or, or treated. So the two examples that are noted here are hemophilia, so a blood clotting disorder, or something like muscular dystrophy, a, mus a muscle wasting disease where if you could insert genetically modified muscle cells, get them to proliferate, um, that could actually either reduce or maybe even prevent mu the symptoms of muscular dystrophy. So as it, as it says here at, in the note at the bottom, um, we would we would think that, and, and up, up till now, somatic cell therapies have really been focused on children or adults, but it's also possible to um, predict that the same kinds of approaches could be useful for uh, developing fetuses in utero, and that's, that's so-called fetal therapy. Um, so that's, that's by way of somatic therapy. Now, among the ethics concerns of the uses of um, genome editing tools, in um, somatic cells is that, that we might go beyond the kinds of therapeutic approaches that I sh have showed on the previous slide. I just went back for a second. So think of the example of muscular dystrophy. So we can easily see how using genome editing tools to make sure that uh, uh, most of these are boys who would be affected by muscular dystrophy um, could have the, the symptoms of that genetic disease either prevented or reduced by giving them uh, muscle cells that were more normal or didn't have the mutation that caused the disease such that they would have normally developing muscles. But the same kind of approach could be used in ways that would enhance an individual. So someone who was otherwise normal but wanted to be stronger, wanted to be a linebacker in the NFL or something, might say, well, I want that thing that was created for muscular dystrophy, but I don't want to use it to um, make me normal, quote unquote, but rather I want to be more muscle bound, and that would be a kind of enhancement. So using the same approach that would be a therapy in one context or even a prevention could be used in a different context as an enhancement. And that distinction between therapy and enhancement has been one that in bioethics has long been thought of as acceptable on one hand, treatment or prevention of disease, versus unacceptable on the other, which is using this, uh, an approach to enhance somebody. And as it says here in the first, first bullet, that would entail making changes beyond what are, quote unquote, the ordinary human capacities. It's, it's a hard line to draw, <clears throat> but as Alta reminded us as she was co-chairing our committee, we don't have to exactly know when the sun has, has set to know when it's light versus when it's dark. So if we were to focus on the, the pretty obviously problematic kinds of applications, we know when enhancement is occurring um, versus when something is being used for treatment or prevention. And as it says here, uh, among the concerns are those that I've already outlined, but also concerns about fairness. Um, if it were, if, if certain enhancement techniques were deemed to be ethically acceptable, but were only available to those who had more money to pay for them, say, um, or when it was sort of seen to be more um, normal or expected that parents would enhance their children. There might be pressure to do so, or there might be uh, inequality of opportunity to, to opt for that. And those are concerns that would need to be addressed as a societal and social matter. Um, we obviously do allow and encourage certain kinds of enhancement. It says here nutrition, education. Um, I always point to examples like piano lessons. I paid a lot of money for my children to learn piano, um, and people who didn't have the op opportunity to do that weren't able to enhance their children's musical abilities. And so we, we certainly not only allow, but encourage that um, in sort of non-genome, non-biological intervention modes. And so um, we would need to think hard, and we argue in the um, report about um, needing to think hard about when it's acceptable and when it's not to use genome editing tools for things like enhancement. And so, as it says here, examples of you know, using um, the same approach that would cure muscular dystrophy to become stronger than normal would be an example. Um, and and, and we, we, we know there would need to be a, a greater discussion um, from the stakeholders involved in whatever society this was being proposed before we would know the answer about whether it's ethically acceptable or not. And we said, before we even get to that point, 
the current um, approaches to using uh, the current knowledge about using genome editing tools in humans for such purposes as enhancement are unlikely to offer benefits that are sufficient to offset the risks at, at this time or really any time soon. And so we would need to get to a point of much greater understanding and level of, of certainty and um, clarity about the risks and benefits posed by genome editing tools in humans before we would be, we, we would think it would be acceptable to think about going forward for other than preventive or curative approaches on the somatic level. The, the uh, recommendations in this area, as it says here, um, were that genome editing for purposes other than treatment or prevention of disease should not be, should not proceed at this time for the reasons I just articulated. And any um, discussion or consideration about um, extending genome editing uh, for purposes other than treatment or prevention would need extensive public input before going forward. And Alta, I know, is going to talk about what we meant by that in her remarks. Um, my, my last uh, topic to um, address is um, the kind of genome ed editing applications that would lead to changes that would be heritable by, by um, offspring and, and future generations. <clears throat> we know that there um, is, is an ability to do this that has been achieved using um, genome editing techniques, both the kinds we're talking about today and previous kinds of attempts at um, gene um, um, therapies. It's been achieved in animals, but there are, are clear technical challenges for the safe and predictable use of such techniques in humans. And before we can get to the point of even thinking about doing it in humans, there will need to be significant further research and development in the basic sciences, uh, in basic science involving human cells as well as in whole animal models before we should ever think about doing so for clinical trials. So the way that it would likely happen really take two forms. Uh, one would be trying to, to modify um, cells that give rise to the germ cells. Sperm would be easier, but perhaps uh, eggs as well. And those are better targets because those are um, cells that only have one genome. Much easier to get the desired um, edit into the genome when there's only one genome to edit rather than many genomes. As uh, an organism uh, grows, it has many genomes in its many cells. And so it would be much more technically feasible to focus on um, things like sperm, uh, precursors to sperm or eggs. Could even start with um, editing in a fertilized egg because that's got, again, only um, one uh, genome and then starts to multiply, of course. So as you see, it says here that the first method, that is um, editing in cells that give rise to sperm or eggs, allows easier verification of edits. And the second is more difficult to verify and obviously would carry risk of some cells getting uh, the desired edit and some not. And of course, then we would not be um, sure about the, the kinds of uh, effects on the resulting um, organism if it were to be implanted and, and grow into a, a, a fetus and eventually a born baby. And so real um, serious considerations about risk uh, and benefit. Um, it, we, we need to be very clear about um, all of the basic science and animal models before even contemplating going forward with any kind of modification that would be passed on to future generations. Serious concerns uh, about what happens in the context of um, editing the germline uh, in that we are passing on those changes into perpetuity. Um, there's some discussion about whether there, if a mistake were made, it might be uh, edited out such that it isn't sort of a one-way kind of um, off into the future, that if the tools are, are as good as people are, are hoping and thinking, that if a, a modification was made that wasn't exactly what was intended, that that could be um, edited again. But of course, we'd want to know that with a, a fair amount of precision and clarity before going forward with anything that would be passed on in the way we're discussing. So unacceptable um, in the course of the discussion in the past because of this concern about multi-generational risks, um, but also it could be quite beneficial, right? There, there's a, obviously a strong kind of argument about benefit of making sure that future generations don't have Huntington's disease as well as the individual who might be affected. So there's pretty clear potential benefit for removing a very bad disease from a, a, a population, potentially. Um, it's hard to figure out how to do the research that would be required because to to really feel confident about 
the risks and, and benefits and the balance, you would need to do long-term follow-up of individuals who were modified in this way. Uh, it's very difficult to get to, to think about how to obtain um, consent for long-term follow-up because the people who would be affected can't give consent. It would be the, a future person and the future generations that would be affected, and you can't get consent from future generations. So it's very challenging to think about that on the typical models of how we think about ethics and individuals deciding for themselves. Some people have um, argued in the past about um, the unacceptability of changes in the germline because it feels like an, an inappropriate um, intervention in, in nature. Playing God is sometimes the shorthand for that. Um, and of course, we intervene in nature in all sorts of other ways, and so there, there needs to be a, a clear argument about what's acceptable in, in other kinds of intervention in nature. We, we don't um, think it's natural anymore to allow people who are infected by um, disease to, to allow that to take its natural course. We use antibiotics and antivirals. So we obviously intervene in nature in some ways. So the question is what, what would be acceptable and what not in the context of genome editing. Uh, we, we also have to be mindful of concerns about people um, feeling like we will modify um, individuals so that certain things will not happen anymore. And what message that sends to people who might have the kinds of diseases or disabilities that would be edited out. Does it say to them, you're not important or you're not as valued uh, by society? And of course, we, we don't think that that's the right um, conclusion, but, but we don't want that to be the social message that is sent by the use of these new technologies. And then the last kind of concern or among the kinds of concerns that, that need to be considered and were articulated in our report is that it, it, it's a, using um, these kinds of techniques in the germline is a step toward modification of our uh, future children in ways that starts to feel like designer babies and the concerns about too much control over what our offspring might look like in ways that are not about them but about us. So. As it says here, some of the conclusions that, that we drew um, are that in light of, of advances, it's now realistically possible to think about using genome editing tools to actually make changes that could be passed on into future generations. It really was not something that was technically feasible in the past. And so rather than think about what was ethically permissible from the perspective of the kinds of issues I raised on the last slide, it was really about it's just too risky, it's just too uncertain. But now that that uncertainty is, is waning and that, that with greater precision, we need to think harder about um, issues that go beyond risk and benefit. As it says, there's interest in considering how we might um, do away with some terrible diseases. I mentioned already Huntington's disease, but one could think of other kinds of, of neurological um, diseases that, that affect children from very early in their lives, like Lestinian syndrome, all, all sorts of a long list. And as it says here, thousands of inherited diseases that could be uh, prevented in future generations through these kinds of tools. Uh, there's also a, a, a small but significant number of people for whom there is no possibility of having genetically related children without passing on a, a, a terrible genetic disease. So when, when two parents uh, both are, are uh, have the Huntington's um, gene, for instance, there are certain um, combinations of of, of mutations such that there's no chance that their offspring won't be affected. So they, they really aren't able to have genetically related children who will not have um, the disease that they carry. And that, that feels like a real challenge that needs to be addressed and there aren't other um, um, options for some of those kinds of diseases. As it says here, for some, um, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, that is testing embryos that are made in vitro outside the body and then implanting those that are not affected, that is a possibility. Um, but for others, um, that is not a possibility, and for some people, those alternatives are just not acceptable. And so uh, what we say in conclusion was that in some cases where there are no alternatives that allow the, the maintenance, the retention of the um, genetic connection between parents and offspring, that um, it, it is something to consider uh, in terms of the use of, uh, of germline modification to, to allow that um, connection to be maintained. Uh, that's the end of my um, slides. I'm now going to hand it off to Alta for um, her um, discussion of regulation and, and oversight. Uh, thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, 
and uh, thank you to everybody who's had the patience to listen to so much of our uh, description of the report. Um, I wanted to now focus a little bit on the regulatory side here and uh, describe the regulations that exist and uh, where we had recommended some additional work on those regulations uh, to point that out. So let me start first with basic research, uh, which was described to you by Katie Bowman. Um, basic research takes place in the laboratory. It does not involve transfer to a human being. And so it has long been the focus of regulation that focuses primarily on safety issues. Institutional biosafety committees look at lab safety as well as environmental safety in the case of release that's more relevant in certain other areas of genetic engineering. Um, institutional review boards, which we associate with human subjects research, may have some role here, but it's primarily to protect the privacy interests of people whose cells are now being used for these laboratory experiments. And the IRB does not have a role in the review of the experiment uh, with regard to its safety, or even in many cases, or most cases, to its uh, purported morality. And then finally, uh, the uh, National Institutes of Health Recombinant DNA Advisory Committee, the so-called RAC Committee, uh, exists to give advice on areas of research that involve recombinant DNA. It uh, can focus on novel areas of research that might pose novel risk, and it can provide, among other things, a venue for public discussion of new kinds of protocols. Uh, sorry. Uh, I think that's what I failed to do before. Okay. Um, now, with regard to somatic therapy, when we're actually talking about an interaction with a, a live-born human or with a fetus, we now have, in addition to those committees I've already described, the uh, jurisdictional control of this research by the Food and Drug Administration. Um, although what we're not, although we are talking about things that do not typically sound like drugs. Uh, in many cases, the introduction of the tools needed to do gene editing involves the introduction of some kind of vector that can itself be uh, a, a substance that meets the definition of a drug in the way that it affects structure and function of the body. And as a result, the FDA has jurisdiction. And in the United States, the FDA exercises pre-market control. That is, before you can even try this with a human in a research setting, you have to get permission because you're working with a material that has not been approved for use in humans. And that gives the FDA the ability to control the initiation of clinical trials. They can look at whether or not preclinical research in the lab as well as in non-human animals is sufficient to give us an understanding of the predicted risks and hope for benefits that would justify a clinical trial. Uh, they also have tremendous role in oversight during the clinical trials. Often those trials require adjustment along the way as new information is developed. But typically they begin with very small numbers of people and slowly build out with populations that are largely uh, free of complicating conditions, diseases, or pharmaceuticals. And if the benefits are now perceived to be reasonable in light of the kinds of risks, which is a calculation that may depend upon whether or not there are alternative therapies out there, uh, whether or not the people who would be using it in the real world would likely have complicating conditions, et cetera. But if those benefits seem reasonable in light of the risks, the FDA can approve this new uh, article, it's called an article under the statute or entity, for clinical use by physicians. At that point, it can be marketed. It can be advertised. It can be marketed directly to physicians. Uh, companies can charge for it, and doctors are free to use it. Um, the FDA also has a role in long-term follow-up in which data is being collected from people who've been the uh, recipients of this kind of therapy in order to make sure, in this case, that the gene editing was stable over time, that whatever was edited has persisted over time, or if it has degraded, it's degraded in a way that is predictable so that new therapy can be initiated, uh, as well as to look for unexpected side effects. And this is also a chance to see how this therapy interacts with the other things that many people are taking in terms of other drugs or having other medical conditions. Um, it's also worth noting that uh, once this is in clinical use, physicians are free to use it for something other than the purpose for which it was originally approved. At the moment of approval, there's a specific intended use that has a specific benefit to risk ratio, uh, 
and the um, this particular substance will be labeled as intended for this and here are the side effects and here are the benefits. Physicians are allowed to use their judgment to then use this beyond that initial labeled indication. Companies are not allowed to advertise for it or try to promote its use for anything other than what's been proven to the FDA, but there is room for physician judgment. And this becomes relevant when we talk about the so-called enhancement question because of the concern that an approval for a therapeutic purpose that is compelling may in the hands of physicians wind up expanding to less compelling uses for enhancement. And uh, there, for the moment, uh, we have a theoretical issue because the particular kinds of therapeutic interventions being developed don't really have the capacity to be used in anything other than that particular therapy. But we may in the future have to face the possibility of expansion beyond current therapy into physician <coughs> decisions to use this for so-called enhancement. So in light of this particular structure of regulation, we concluded that the uh, existing structure, uh, both in terms of the ethical norms and the regulatory regimes, is sufficient for laboratory and somatic research, uh, that um, we should limit the clinical trials that the FDA permits and limit the intended uses for which they approve treatments for, to those things that are treating and preventing a disease or a disability. Um, but we recognize that that may change over time. And um, that there are specific concerns that have been raised in the past about uh, certain aspects of uh, genome editing, in particular specificity and the possibility of an off-target event, and that this needs to have a particularly close eye, um, but we can't set a particular standard for the number of off-target events because it's going to vary depending upon the indication and also on how compelling the need might be. Um, when it comes to heritable genome editing, or so-called germline editing, um, we have a different set of issues in terms of regulation. Uh, all the regulations that cover laboratory work and human subject protections in clinical trials would be applicable. Um, but uh, if we did this with embryos, which is less likely, I think Jeff has explained why we would do it in gametes, but if done with embryos, there are a number of uh, states that have forbidden research with embryos that would make it impossible. Uh, and at the federal level, there is a prohibition on the use of federal money for research that involves putting embryos at risk of destruction. So uh, most of the research for this kind of germline editing, if it involved embryos, would have to be funded privately. In addition, um, even if there was a proof at the preclinical level that uh, germline editing was effective and uh, that the risks were minimizable or minimal, um, we still could not in the United States have the FDA permit a clinical trial by which adults try to conceive using genome editing as part of the process. And the reason is that at this particular time, there's a provision in the budget statute that was passed in continuing resolution that prohibits the FDA from uh, accepting and reviewing a proposal to begin a clinical trial. But we went forward with our, with our recommendations nonetheless, despite these obstacles in the United States, because we saw this as a report that had an international scope and that other countries may very well go forward with this even before the United States does or even if the United States never does. And so in anticipation that there's going to be a global variation from prohibition uh, to authorization, we decided to move forward uh, with some particular recommendations. Now, as Jeff has mentioned, we concluded that uh, there's a lot of caution that's needed here because of the multi-generational aspect of this, but that caution does not necessitate absolute prohibition. We did, however, come up with a set of standards we thought was strict enough that it would be challenging to meet them anytime soon. Uh, and uh, if they could be met, that would eliminate or at least minimize some of the concerns that Jeff laid out. So for example, we identified uh, many areas of research that need much more development before we'd be able to make assessments of both risk and benefit that would satisfy the standards that, for example, our own FDA might have used. Um, we also focused on the need to restrict its use to very specific situations and make sure that it proceeds under strict oversight. So for example, an absence of reasonable alternatives. We did not recommend this be permitted, uh, even in a clinical trial, if it is 
not particularly necessary for people in order to have genetically related children while minimizing the risk of passing on serious uh, diseases or conditions. And that's why we wanted to restrict it to those serious genetic conditions. We also recommended that this not be permitted until there's been enough research to show that the gene that you want to edit, whether it's to delete or to modify, um, has been strongly and convincingly shown to predispose to the disease or condition. In other words, don't proceed until you know that what you're correcting is the right thing to correct. Uh, and that once you do go forward with a correction or a deletion or any kind of modification, that the result should be a genetic profile that is typical of the population and known to be associated with ordinary health. This would preclude then trying to edit in a way that gives somebody anything that's not been known in the human species or even things that are incredibly rare. Uh, we're looking for a way to produce, as our colleague on the committee, Barry Collar, said, healthy babies, not designer babies. Um, and then um, with regard to the oversight during the clinical trials, we were aware of how complicated it can be to do long-term and multi-generational trials. And so we recommended that the plan for such a follow-up be part of the initial protocol and that a company that wants to or a sponsor that wants to proceed with this research may not begin with a promise to figure this out later, but this has to be built in both in terms of logistics and in terms of finance so that we have the ability to track this over time and learn from it and see where the benefits actually have been realized and see if there are risks that we've over or underestimated or in fact missed entirely. Um, and then finally, we really did want to make sure that with uh, germline editing that we have a mechanism to prevent extension to uses that go beyond serious disease or condition. Uh, and this can be done in a number of ways. The United States may have some limitations due to physician discretion, but we still have a variety of monitoring measures and a risk evaluation and uh, remedi mediation, sorry, uh, minimization methods. Other countries like the UK have uh, a more uh, vertically integrated and comprehensive system by which they put a great deal of control on what physicians may or may not do and where they may or may not do it and might have an easier time complying with this particular condition that we laid out about prevention, uh, preventing extension to other uses. It's important to note that uh, particularly with regard to the somatic uh, cell therapy and the heritable editing, that we did not conclude that these are things that people have a constitutional right to have. There is political discretion here to permit this or to prohibit this. We recommended that it be permitted under the conditions we outlined, uh, and we uh, noted that the presumption in the U.S. is that things are permitted until somebody has prohibited them. Um, but there is still the possibility of legislatures uh, having a process by which they gather public, in, public opinion and uh, make a choice about whether or not to permit some or all of these things to go forward. Um, short of legislation, there simply is the ability to use public input to help guide how the trials are constructed, the kind of information people need to be given, how to make sure that the transparency is uh, achieved, and how to explain the risks and benefits in a way that makes it uh, understandable and uh, subject to evaluation. And so for that, we've got uh, bioethics commissions at the federal and some state levels. We have the RACS venue for public discussion. Uh, we have professional conferences, we have disease groups that have conversations, and so we, in the report, tried to outline a variety of these things without suggesting that they are a complete list, and uh, mostly we think that this kind of input is important in order to understand the values that we should be placing on the importance of having genetically related children, as well as the value that we should be placing on the ability to evade certain kinds of genetic diseases versus having to simply deal with them. Um, after birth or in our lives. So to sum the key messages of the report, that genome editing uh, in the context of basic and somatic research is, is valuable and adequately regulated, that somatic therapy at this time should be used only for treatment and prevention of disease and disability, not for enhancement, uh, but public engagement is needed to think about that question for the future, that heritable editing needs a lot of research as well as a lot of public input before we even thought about trying it. Uh, 
uh, and for the moment that we cannot try it in the United States, uh, but that if we ever do get to the point where it's permitted here, it must be done under the strictest possible oversight with the strictest possible criteria. And with that, I'll turn it back over to uh, the Genetic Alliance. Thank you. <clears throat> Great. Thank you so much, Alta, Jeff, and uh, Katie. This uh, really phenomenal summary of a phenomenal report and an amazing experience. Uh, so <clears throat> before we start the questions, I'll just add, I think you can all see uh, participants here that uh, this has really uh, been a phenomenal study in the sense of really understanding the landscape around gene editing, but then the regulatory and ethical issues, which are extremely complex, uh, have been really well parsed by the experts on our committee and many of the experts that also visited with us. Um, it was a really amazing experience to be part of such a uh, kind of iterative um, uh, march toward these recommendations. Uh, so we're going to start with questions. A reminder that you can put your questions in the question box. We will get to as many of them as we can. In some cases, if they're very pointed ones, we will send them to Katie, Alta, or Jeff. Um, uh, in other cases, uh, we'll just have to do with uh, what we have here and with the report, which um, I really um, recommend people read because uh, we did a, a, a overall wonderful job, I think, putting that together. So first question, and I, I will be, by the way, trying to bucket several questions into one so that we are not repeating the topics and we get to several. Uh, so first question, uh, how successful are gene therapies in vivo, how many cells need to be successfully edited to change a disease phenotype, and it seems that it would be very difficult to have a high enough editing rate to make a significant change. Um, I'm going to take that briefly and then turn it over to Katie and, and Jeff, because there was a piece that came out just this week about an effort to deal with um, uh, uh, hemophilia. Now, it's using gene editing of a different technology, not CRISPR, it's using zinc finger nucleases which are a little bit more difficult to uh, develop but uh, have a longer track record. And the target organ was the liver. And the reason why the liver is a good target organ is that the cells there don't tend to be dying and replicating uh, the way cells in other parts of the body are until you've actually had a trauma or some kind of loss of liver tissue, at least not at the same rate. And so it became possible to actually make an edit that was stable, and it has, in fact, successfully already shown some positive results for these young men. Uh, it's a very small sample at the moment, but it's a very promising clinical trial. Katie and Jeff, did you want to add anything about the cancer trials or anything else? Um, actually, this is Katie. I, I didn't necessarily want to add particularly about cancer, but picking up on the um, example of hemophilia and the question, I think it's a good illustration of the fact that different uh, potential conditions might require different levels of um, success in, in terms of editing numbers of cells in order to have an effect. And so hemophilia is a very interesting example because there are um, different types of mutations that can cause hemophilia. And in some cases, even um, a relatively um, lower level of correction can actually, it perhaps doesn't fully correct the phenotype back to what would be kind of considered the, the kind of common levels, but it, it can still actually mitigate or ameliorate the disease symptoms significantly. And so um, I, I think there's not a simple answer to that question. It might depend on the particular disease and the, the way that that plays out. But in some cases, even correcting a, a relatively smaller number of cells can actually have a positive effect for the patients who have that disease. I'll be, I'll be really Thanks. quick. Um, I, I served ahead, on the back. I was a member of the RAC for five years, and I would just say that this, of course, is an ongoing question and challenge, and that the genome editing tools seem to offer a, a path to more efficient um, uh, modification of, of the, and, and get, getting the right genetic modification into the right cells. So, in fact, this might be a path to making that happen more efficiently rather than creating more challenges. Thanks. Very much. Um, okay, this one, uh, a four-part question. I'm going to present it all at once, and then uh, you, you all can figure out which parts of it you want to jump on. So what countries are performing editing research but not participating in international discussions? Because of U.S. regulations, it's, it seems like editing developments, good or bad, will occur outside of the U.S. I've heard the technology is pretty easy. What about rogue individuals in the U.S. or other countries? I think we sometimes refer to that as doing this in your garage. How will diversity be promoted 
in public input various races, socioeconomic groups, education level, religions, or not? Who would like Walter, to start that? Walter, to answer that. Um, I think we're all going to wind up answering that. Uh, so first, what countries have this research going on but have not participated? Uh, I am not aware offhand of any. Um, it's difficult to know because uh, some of the research is potentially going on in places that are publishing in languages other than English, and I'm not reading their journals. Uh, but, uh, you know, China has been a big player here. It has very much been involved in these discussions. Uh, we're beginning to get some interest from uh, South America, from Argentina and Brazil in particular. Some of the interest has been in the non-human applications. I think there there's a wider range of interest because of its potential use in the agricultural sector. Um, how does one stop the rogues? Uh, there's no way to absolutely stop the rogues, just like there's no way to stop every crime uh, or every uh, you know, behavior that you want to discourage. What you can do is you can try to create new international norms, and we're doing that through a series of international meetings in which uh, the academies of science and medicine in various countries and the scientists around the world are gathering to develop a sense of what is safe and what is effective and what is responsible. And uh, we've seen that there's a widespread um, acceptance of the idea of norms where people really want to earn the respect of their colleagues. Uh, this does not preclude the so-called garage experiment, but I will tell you that garage experiments with humans is really not terribly realistic. And I think there the bigger issue is going to be the garage experiment with um, individual, you know, with individual cells or with uh, agricultural applications. Um, uh, the diversity. Uh, I think that's just a challenge for any kind of public engagement on any topic, and I think part of it is about how one reaches out to interest groups that can themselves motivate their own members to participate, send in comments on regulations, uh, since there are formal comment periods on regs and on guidances, et cetera, as well as taking full possible, fullest possible advantage of the public commissions that have been set up in a number of states and uh, at the federal level. Um, I'll turn that back over to Jeff and Katie to add to that. I, I, I would just I, I totally agree with what you said, Alta, and, and maybe point out that um, we have a problem of, of rogues or people going to places where the, the regulations are more lax or non-existent. And so, you know, creating, as Alta said, international norms is a way to help blunt that. It's not possible, I think, to um, pro make it so it will never happen. Um, but it's, it feels like the it's an unusual example, but that the, the major players are all participating, and that's, of course, what makes this a very important undertaking, that the major players in the world of, of gene editing research and science and potential application are, are talking to each other. And that's, I think, a very positive um, takeaway here. Thanks. And I think we'll take one more question. We have one minute, in re and you may make this more general, but in relation with the next generation CAR-T cells using genome editing techniques, and I think this is the kind of more uh, general question, how do you think off-target effects in genome stability are going to be assessed? Do you think it's going to be part of regulatory requirements in the manufacturing process? Katie, did you want to start with that? I can talk about the regulations, but you might want to talk about the science. Um, well, I, I think the, the, the committee's report um, did look at that question, and I think it's very difficult um, to have, for example, a single standard for what those off-target effects should be. There are community efforts now to try to get um, a sense of what the process is, um, kind of what's the, what are the theories of, of uh, best practices and tests and things that the, the scientific community can do to assess the off-target effect, um, which is going to be very much, I think, um, affected by the particular cell type that's being edited, um, the, the actual particular edit that's being made. Um, what's really interesting about the science, I think, is that it's moving fast enough and there's enough interest in this area that the, the off-target effects or the, the kind of mis unintended editing um, that's being observed in, in laboratory cells and these other systems is continually um, being lowered. And so it, it, it's looking like that is becoming less of a concern. I, I think there will 
also you can probably speak more to this for the for the FDA and the kind of as one moves into the idea of clinical trials and and how one thinks about what's an, sort of an acceptable level of of uh, balancing safety and efficacy the, the uh, there will certainly be needs to need need to be reporting on what those measured off target effects are um and i think that's going to be part of that it's just i don't think that there's going to be a possibility to have sort of a single a single level that meets all of the circumstances um, when one kind of looks in the regulatory system and looks at that balance that I think also you'll probably speak more about. Yeah, no, no, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, so this is why the, there is a need for long-term follow-up, not only for germline, but for somatic, so that over time uh, there can be data collection on the stability of the change and on collection of information about any off-target effects or other kinds of side effects that have occurred as a result of the edit. Um, whether or not those will be tolerable is going to depend upon the level of benefit, the available alternative therapies these people might use, and um, whether or not there is some way to offset any problems through an additional intervention. Uh, but the follow-up also is an opportunity to take a look at the kind of, you know, the, the mechanisms by which these effects are, are occurring and how they are making a, an impact on the actual health or well-being of the patients. Uh, because it also gives insight into the function of the genes and the gene expression itself that might lead to additional research in the future that refines these particular techniques. Great, thank you. Well, we're at the top of the hour again. This hour went back, uh, went by very quickly. Right now, you're getting quite a lo large number of excellent presentation. Well done, thanks. Uh, so we're really thrilled. Uh, to have had this webinar, really thrilled with your expertise and, and also your dedication to this, uh, this topic. And uh, thank you to all the participants. Uh, this is recorded, and so you can share the link. We will be sending you this and some materials uh, that are related uh, from the NAS on Monday. Thanks all, and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.